Hello, my name is Keshwani. It's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here, the GMAT Official Guide 2021. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today we will solve some data sufficiency problems. Data sufficiency problems that you will find on page number 212. But before we dive into that, yesterday we were doing some multiple choice problems on page number 95 or rather page number page number 76. We were doing some multiple choice problem on page number 76. And the very last problem in the video, as I was doing it, the very last problem on the page number 96. I made a mistake and I could not finish the problem, I left it there and the mistake I made is that I, 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 I miswrote something here. This should be from 2 to 3, so I'm going to quickly go over this entire problem, we're going to redo it, so this out of the way. So here in this particular problem, if you turn to page number 76, make sure the book is, make sure the book is in front of you, as I always tell you, turn to page number 76, take, take a look at number 96. It says that we are recording some, we are recording some programs from television on our VCR. And these are the number of recordings we have done in different days. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 4020. And these are the number of hours of programming that we have watched. The question simply is, what is the range for the number of hours of recorded programs that we have not yet watched? What's the range for the number of hours of recorded programs, the hours that we recorded, that we have not watched yet? Which is what this is, hours not watched. So let's take at the number of hours that we did record. On Tuesday we record four hours of programming, on Wednesday we recorded nothing, on Thursday we have two hours, on Friday we have zero, we have a total of six hours of recording that we have done. And these are the number of hours that we have watched. On Tuesday we, we are told that we watched nothing at all, even though we recorded four hours, but we watched nothing. On Wednesday we, we watched between one and two hours, on Thursday we watched nothing at all, and on Friday we watched between two and three, not between three and five, between two and three hours. So. The range that we're looking for, the number of hours not washed. Before we worry about, before we worry about the range for the number of hours not washed, let's find the range for the number of hours that we did watch. So here is one, and here is two. So the low range is three. The low is three. And here we, we watch up to two hours on Tuesday, uh, or rather on Wednesday, and we watch up to three hours on Friday, which means we watch up to five hours between three and five hours of programming we watched that we have recorded, which is what I ended up writing here by mistake, which is why I couldn't solve the problem. So here, so we are done. We are looking for the hours, hours not watched, which is what they call the H here. H, we are looking for the range of it. So here we go. So it's between three and five hours of recording that we have done. So the hours that we have not, but because we, are, because we recorded six hours and we watched only three hours, we, there are three hours that we have not watched. Or, or the other extreme is that we watched five hours we recorded six hours, we watched five hours, so there is only one hour that we have not watched. And they're looking for the range. Since they're looking for the range, it's not three to one obviously, it's from one to three. It's between one and three hours. It's between one and three hours of programming that we have recorded and yet not yet watched. Somewhere between one and three hours. So that is it, that is it. It's hours away. Today is day number 28 and today we'll do some today we'll do some data sufficiency problems that you will find on page number 212. 212. Let's get going, shall we? The very first one is the geometry problem. We are given a picture here that looks something like this. We are told that this is R, this is T, this is angle S, this is angle X, and this is angle Y. And I don't know why they have to name so many things here. But this is this is what they're calling P, R, S, T, and Q. Enough of that. Let's let's take a look at it. The question simply is. So this is the x degrees and this is the y degrees. This question simply is, what is the sum of x and y? It's very important that you understand that what we are being asked here is the sum of x and y. 
We don't have to figure out the x and y individually, which is the mistake people end up making. They try to find the x individually, y individually, and then say, well, I can't do it. Obviously, you can't do it, because you're not being asked to find out what x is. You're not being asked to find out what y is. We're being asked what is their sum, and that's all we need to worry about here. Let's see what the first statement tells us. The first statement tells us that the s is 4. So let's, watch, let's see what happens. If s is 4, David made a story. If s is, rather 40, if s is 40, if s is 40, what, what, what that means is that r plus t must be 140. r plus t must be 140. I'm going to erase this, this, co this name that they give us. It's not necessary. It's just annoying. It serves no purpose. We're just interested in the angles. So one more time, we are told that the angle s is 40. If angle, if angle s is 40, angle r and angle t must add up to 140. Okay, so here we go. And we also know that x plus r x plus r is 180, we know x plus r is 180 because it's a straight line and similarly t plus y, t plus y is also 180 which means it is simply 180 times 2, this sum. Let's, we're looking for x plus y, so here's your x and here's our y, so let's put them together, x plus y and here's our r plus t and that has to equal 360. We already know we already know what r plus t is. r plus t is 140. So x plus y must be 360 minus 140. Whatever it is, we, don't, we really don't care. The point here is that the first statement by itself is quite enough for us to figure out what is the sum of angle x and angle y. A, D, B, C, E. Since the first statement by, itse since the first statement by itself was enough, the answers, answer cannot be B, C or E. It will have to be either A or D. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that R is 70. R is 70. So now we have to erase everything that we have from before. All of this goes away. This goes away. All we know at this point, all we know is that at this point that R is 70. If R is 70, if R is 70, then all we can say is that X must be 110. All we can say is that X must be 110. We have no knowledge at all as to why, what y is. And until we know why, we cannot answer this question. What is x plus y? We cannot answer it. We do not know. There is not enough information. There is not enough data. Which means the second statement by itself is not enough. The answer cannot be D. It has to be A. The answer to this problem is A. Only statement A by itself is enough for us to be able to answer the question. Next problem. We are on page number 212, that was 345 that we just finished, the very first problem on the page. Let's look at 346. Number 346, it says that the points, points R, S and T lie on a line. They lie on a line. We are further told that R is 5 meters from T and and 2 meters from S. The question simply is how far is how far is S from T? How far is S from T? We are interested in this distance. Distance S to T is what we're looking for and that's all. Let's see what the first statement tells us. The first statement tells us that R is between S and T. R is between S and T. Let's see what we can do here. R is between S and T. So let's just draw a line. R is between S and T. Here is our S. Here is our T. And R is between there. And we are told, originally in the problem itself, that R is 5 meters from T. Here is your R. R is 5 meters from T. And we are told that it's 2 meters from S. R is 2 meters from S. There you go. If R is 2 meters from S and 5 meters from T, we can figure out how much the distance is from S to T. S to T is 7. Another possibility, of course, is that they can be other way around. Maybe they are other way around. Maybe this is T and maybe this is S. Maybe this is T and this is S. In which case, nothing will change. The 5 will simply appear here and 2 will simply appear there. But nothing else will change. Nothing else will change. The answer will still be 7. The answer will still be the same which is that uh, two points are seven units apart, seven meters apart. The first statement by itself is quite enough 
for us to figure out the distance AD BCE. Since first statement by itself is enough, we know now that the answer has to be either A or D. Let's look at second statement. Statement 2 says the statement 2 says that S is to the left of R and T is to the right of R. This is right and this is left. Well actually this one this one is even easier. This one is even easier because we don't have to look at two scenarios, we only have to look at one scenario. We are told that S is to the left of R, so here's our R, S is to the left of R, and T is to the right of R. There you go. So in the earlier case we have to look at two scenarios, here we, have, here we just have to look at one scenario to make it even simpler. And we know that R is 5 meters from T, same as before, same as before, and, and it's 2 meters from S, R is 2 meters from S, same as before, it's 7. Both of the statements are enough by themselves. Each statement by enough is, is enough, each, each statement by, by itself is sufficient, is enough for us to be able to answer the question. The answer is D. The answer is D. Three hundred and forty-seven. Three hundred and forty-seven. Let's see what it says. Three hundred and forty-seven is just damn stupid. It's just bloody stupid. Idiotic. Here we go. Here's the question. It says, is n equal to 0? Is n equal to 0? And like I have told you before many times, these questions which I typically, I get annoyed and I call them idiotic and stupid and damn thing, bloody thing. But those are in fact good for us. They are, they are gifts. The reason I get annoyed is because they're just too simple. Well, they are, if they're too simple, they're just gifts. They're just gifts. Take them and walk away. Don't answer it. Don't question about it. Don't don't complain about it. Just pick it up and move away. Move, move along. Do you understand? This is a gift. It says that his question is is n equal to zero, and then they go on to tell you that n plus m equals to zero, where where m does not equal to zero. Well, if m does not equal to zero and their product is zero, then this bloody thing must be zero. Obviously, how else are we going to get zero? If the product of two numbers is zero and we are told that one of them is not equal to zero, then the other one must be zero, obviously. That's the only way, that's the only way we're going to be able to get a zero out of it. That's the only way the product of two numbers can be zero. If the product of two numbers is zero, there are only three possibilities. If product of A and B is zero, if we are told, then there are only three possibilities. One is that, that both A and B are zero, or A is zero, or B is zero. Here they, they are not both zero because we are told that m is not equal to zero. That means n must be zero. Number two. I think I made too much fuss about it. I ended up explaining way too much for something so simple. Number, number statement number two is even sillier. Statement number two is even sillier. We are told that n plus zero is zero. Well then in that case n must be zero obviously. The answer is d. Each statement by itself is enough. If n plus 0 is 0, then obviously n is 0. 348. On 348, we are told that on a map, on a map, the scale is on a map, the scale that is used is that every half inch means 100 miles. Every half inch signifies a distance of 100 miles. The question simply is, how far, how far is city, how far is city X from city Y? The first statement tells us, the first statement tells us that X is 3 inches from Y. Well, that's enough. If x is 3 inches from y, that's more than enough to figure out how far x is from y in reality. Every half inch is 100 miles, which means every 1 inch is 200 miles, so 3 inches will be 600 miles. A, D, B, C, E. The answer cannot be B, C or E. 
Some of them are just way too simple and some of them are not so. Number two. Statement number two. Statement number two tells us that X and Y are 300 miles from Z. Knowing that X and Y are 300 miles from Z does not tell us how far is X to Y. For example, here is your isosceles triangle here. This is 300 miles, this is 300 miles. And X and Y are 300 miles from Z. There is your Z and there is your X and Y. We cannot figure out what that is. Do you understand? I should not have made that simple because making it isosceles triangle, we can figure it out what that is. But it is not necessarily isosceles. It could be anything. It could be anything. For example, here is your Z. I made it. There you go. X and Y are 300 miles from, they don't have to be isosceles, it could be anything, but you get the idea. We cannot figure out the distance from X and Y simply knowing, uh, simply knowing that they are both 300 miles from, from city Z. The answer is, so second statement by itself is not enough, the first one was enough, the answer is A. Here, here's, here's the situation, you see, here's, here's your Z, and this is 300, and this is 300, and this is X and Y, this is one possibility. There are millions of possibilities, I'm just showing you two. One of the possibilities is that this is Z, and this is X, and this is Y, and they are both 300 miles away from Z, they are both 300 miles from Z. Of course, the distance from X to Y here is much different than the distance from X to Y here. The way that I drew it earlier, that requires the condition that it makes an isosceles triangle. There is nowhere in the problem that says that. It was, it was silly of me, it was stupid of me to actually draw it as an isosceles triangle. I took liberties. That was 348. 349. 349 says, what's the remainder? when positive integer n is divided by 5. So we are told that we have some integer which is positive. It's a whole number, positive whole number. Question is when we divide it by 5, what's the remainder? Let's see what they tell us in statement 1. Statement 1 tells us that when, when n is when n is divided by 3, quotient, quotient is 4, and remainder is 1. So we do have to know what these words mean, quotient. Quotient is simply, quotient is simply a very fancy way of saying the result of a division problem. So here it says that when n is divided by 3, so this here's your, here's our n, when, it, when we divide it by 3, the result of that division, the result of that division, the quotient is 4, quotient is 4, and the remainder is 1. Remainder is 1. 3 times 4 is 12, so this must be 12, and the remainder is 1. So if remainder is 1, and 3 times 4 is 12, then n must be 13. This tells us, this statement tells us that n must be 13. And if n is equal to 13, of course we can answer this question. What is the remainder when is n is divided by 3? Well, when you divide 13 by, rather, by 5, when you divide 13 by 5, if you were to divide 13 by 5, if you were to divide n by 5, the remainder, of course, is going to be 3. Of course we can answer that. I don't know why I saw the need to write it out. We don't have to write it out. Yeah, the first statement is enough. A, D. B, C, E. The first statement by itself is enough. The answer is either A or D. Let's look at second statement. Second statement says that when n is divided by 4, when n is divided by 4, the 
remainder remainder is 1. The difference between the first statement and the second statement is that in the first statement they told us the remainder as a, as a result of the division but they also told us the quotient. Here they are not telling us the quotient and because they are not telling us the quotient n could be anything. For example n could be 5 and, and when, you, when you divide n by 4 we are told that the remainder is 1. Or well, maybe n is 5. 5 divided by 4 will give us a remainder of 1. Or maybe n is, uh, maybe n is uh, 9. 9 divided by 4 will give us a remainder of 1. You see? We don't know it. There are, there are millions of different possibilities. If it is in fact 5, if, if n is in fact 5, then n divided by 5 will give us a remainder of 0. If it turns out that n is not 5, n is in fact 9, then 9 divided by 5 will give us a remainder of 4. We can't really tell. We can't really tell what the remainder is based on what they gave us in the second statement. So in this case, the second statement is not enough by itself. Only the first statement was enough. The answer is A. The answer is A. That was 349. Let's move on. And let's do the very last problem on the page. Number 350. Number 350. Number 350 says that R and S are positive numbers. R and S. R and S are positive numbers. They use the word numbers, positive numbers, not necessarily integers. They don't need to be whole numbers. Keep that in mind. Sometimes language is very important. But not sometimes, always. The words are very important. They're telling us that this Greek letter theta is pronounced, this thing is pronounced as theta, is a Greek letter theta. We are told this Greek letter theta represents, represents one of the, one of the four basic operations. And of course we know what the basic operations are. There are four of them, which is why it's called a four, four operation basic calculator. A basic four function calculator it simply has four operations, four basic operations. The addition, the subtraction, the multiplication, and the division. Those are the four operations. And theta represents one of these four operations. The question simply is, which operation is theta? Let's see what the first one tells us. Statement one, statement 1 tells us that if r is equal to s, then r theta s is equal to 0. r theta s is equal to 0. Well, if r theta s is equal to 0, plug in numbers if you like. Plug in numbers. If it makes your life easier, plug in numbers. Think of this as 2 and 3. If, oh, if r equals s. Oh, they are equal. So this time with 2 and 3, it's got to be 2 and 2. Think of them as 2 plus 2 will not equal 0. 2 times 2 will not equal 0. 2 divided by 2 will not equal 0. The only time when the two numbers are equal and there are, as a result of some operation, the result is 0 is when it must be, when one, when one must be subtracted from the other. When one must be subtracted from the other. Which operation does theta represent? The answer here is theta represents subtraction. We are able to answer the question. The question was which operation does theta represent? The answer is subtraction. The first statement by itself is quite enough. A D B C E. The first statement was enough for us to be able to answer the question. First statement was enough for us to be able to identify the operation. The operation here that is being performed is simple subtraction. When two numbers are equal, when you subtract one from the other, the answer is a big fat zero. Let's see what the second one says. Tells us. Second statement tells us that if r is not equal to if r is not equal to s, if they are not equal to s, if they are not equal to each other, then r theta s does not equal s theta r. Well, again, think of them as two numbers, two and three, two and three. Well, if they're, if they're 2 and 3, think of this as 2 and 3, if they're 2 and 3, addition would work. 
addition would work because 3 plus 2 does equal 2 plus 3. So we know it's not addition because addition they equal equal to each other. We also know they're not multiplication. They're not multiplication because the multiplication two products will be equal to each other, which means it must be either subtraction or division. Subtraction or division because in the case of subtraction, 3 minus 2 does not equal 2 minus 3. And same thing in the case of division. 3 divided by 2, of course, does not equal 2 divided by 3. So, can we answer the question, which operation does Taylor represent? Which operation does Taylor represent? The answer is, we don't know. We don't know. It could be subtraction or it could be division. We can't really tell. The answer is A. The first statement by itself was enough, but the second statement is not. That was the end of it. If you wish to get hold of me, I forgot to say this in the beginning of the video, if you wish to get hold of me, to, if you decide that you would like to work with me to help you get ready for the exam, that you would like to hire me as your tutor, you can send me an email at kishwaniprep at icloud.com. We'll meet again tomorrow and we'll continue the multiple choice problems where we left off yesterday. Alright, bye now.